Good afternoon. I am Gregory Washington, the president of George Mason University, and it is my pleasure to welcome you Russia's war on Ukraine in a historical perspective. Our Russian and Eurasian studies program developed this 12 part series as part of a course Mason faculty are teaching on Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The goal of this series is to present the work of 12 scholars and writers from around the world. Their insights help us to understand the historical relationship between Russia and Ukraine, the invasion itself, and the remarkable resistance of the Ukrainian people. Through the perspective of these historians, we are better able to comprehend the war in Ukraine in a broader context. This series is an illustration of how humanities research in a public research university can create knowledge, spur discussion, and expand understanding of complex global issues. We appreciate your viewership of this series, and we are proud that George Mason University can bring it to you. Enjoy. Well, thank you, Professor Washington, uh, President Washington and Professor Washington. Uh, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, I'm Steve Barnes, I'm a professor here uh, at George Mason University. Uh, in addition to today's speaker, uh, I'm joined by Jessica Dotrieve, a PhD candidate here at Mason in US history. I wanna welcome you to the fifth in our ongoing series. Uh, you're here each Monday as part of my online class, History 388, Russia's War in Ukraine and Historical Perspective, where I bring you an example of what the classroom at a public research university can be at its best, a space to have the critical conversations about our world, using the tools of scholars and scholarship to make sense of the senseless as we all try to become better citizens and better participants in the human community. With the support of the program in Russian and Eurasian Studies, the Department of History and Art History, the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, and the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, all parts of our George Mason University community, I've been able to bring you some of the scholars whose work has inspired me and caused me to think more deeply about this war, to be sure, but also about what it means to respect human rights and human dignity. The need to have those conversations has been driven home today as Russia launched missile attacks against civilian targets in cities across Ukraine, cheered on by too many in Russia today, and relativized and excused by the intellectually impoverished on the political extremes in the West, and accomplishing nothing more than the sating of bloodlust and stealing the resolve ever, ever further of the Ukrainian people that Russia cannot be allowed to win and will not be allowed to win. By the way, can I comment for just a moment that I received an incredible email this morning from someone whom I won't name for privacy reasons, but who took the time to write this. Unfortunately, I will not be able to join today. There is no light in my city after the rocket attack carried out by fascist Russia. I still have a little charge on my mobile phone, but I keep it in order to be in touch with my relatives. But I will definitely watch the recording of the event. At this moment, it is important that we continue to support Ukraine because they support us. And I'll ask again that you consider making donations to Razum for Ukraine, which works fearlessly on the ground in Ukraine to provide humanitarian relief and recovery assistance. To further the discussion and to attempt to discuss the myriad questions we can never quite get to in these sessions, please join me and Professor Cynthia Hooper of the College of the Holy Cross on Fridays at 3 p.m. Eastern for Russia's war on Ukraine and its consequences for the world, a weekly Q&A. It is online, free, and open to the public and allows you to more directly be part of the conversation. Further, check out my Twitter feed where using the hashtag RWOU, I try to share readings, films, and reactions to our weekly speakers. Feel free to use that hashtag and tag me as well if you have questions or responses. When this full-scale invasion broke out on February 24th, one of the books that I turned to was one I'd read portions of a couple of years back. 
Written by today's speaker and my grad school friend and colleague, Marcy Shore, The Ukrainian Night, which you can see here over my left shoulder, could not be worth more of your time uh, as it explores the events of Euromaidan, the revolution in Ukraine over the winter months of 2013-2014, told through the eyes of its participants. The voices in this book, along with the voice of its author, are filled with an incredible humanity. I frequently found myself tearing up at the incredible promise and the hope of what Ukrainians called the revolution of dignity, and how Vladimir Putin and Russia have for eight years now attempted to cynically drown that promise in the blood of innocence for the sake of imperial aggrandizement. Today's speaker, Marcy Shore, is a professor in Yale University's Department of History, where her research focuses on modern Central and East European intellectual history. In addition to the Ukrainian night, you can read her other books, including The Taste of Ashes, The Afterlife of Totalitarianism in Eastern Europe. You can find her writings all over the public sphere, and I'll share some of those that my students are reading on Twitter later this week. Please submit your questions at any time using the Q&A feature on Zoom, and I'll ask as many as I'm able after Professor Shore finishes her talk. A quick program note, next week and for the remainder of our sessions, we will return to our usual 3 p.m. Eastern start time on Mondays, and I look forward to having you there. With that, Marcy, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Steve. Can, can you all hear me? Is this yes. working? Okay. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Um, for those of you who don't know, Steve and I went to graduate school together at Stanford in the 1990s. It's always a pleasure to see my old friends from graduate school. I, I somewhat wish this were under happier circumstances, um, but I'm grateful for the occasion to be here. And I think one of the things that, that Steve and I share, um, and I like to think, in fact, we share with basically all of my you know, old friends and you know, ones I've made in the meantime, our Slavicist colleagues, is a sense of responsibility to play the role of the bridge at this particular moment. Um, eight years ago, when, when the war began, the Donbass, I kept thinking of what Neville Chamberlain had said to the British people on in, in late September uh, 1938, when he decided to let Hitler take over the Sudetenland at the Munich conference. Um, this was the infamous appeasement at Munich, which in Czech, they say the betrayal at Munich. And Chamberlain said at that point to the British people why they were letting Hitler take over the Sudetenland, a strip of land in the western part of Czechoslovakia, um, in order to avoid going to war. And he said how horrible that we would be trying on gas masks and digging trenches on behalf of a quarrel in a faraway country between people about whom we know nothing. And when the war broke out in this far eastern mining region of, of far eastern Ukraine in the Donbass eight years ago, I had this creepy feeling that this could be that quarrel in the faraway country between people about whom we know nothing that could be the beginning of, of the Third World War. Um, now, um, Obviously, our you know Steve and I and our colleagues, our, our agency to personally stop Putin is somewhat limited. But at the very least, um, what we can do is make those people in the faraway country no longer people about whom we know nothing. Um, and since that's what we can do, that's what we should be doing. And I'm I'm grateful for the occasion to participate in something that I've been really moved to see so many of our friends and colleagues stepping up to do. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you, and it's always, even after all this pandemic and then wartime, it's still hard for me to talk into this black box of the computer because I keep looking for the facial reactions of the audience and I can't see anybody, which is odd to me. Um, and I'm never quite sure how quickly to talk and when what I'm saying is obvious and when it's not obvious. Um, so I will just kind of guess, you know, where I think the audience might be. And what I'm going to try to do is tell a bit of a story about post-communist Ukraine to kind of take us through this narrative arc from the fall of the Soviet Union to the present moment um, with the hope that it will not bore those of you who already know the story and will not be too fast for those of you who don't know the story. And then you're welcome to ask me questions. <laughs> 
Um, so as, as a kind of brief reminder for those of you who are not mired in Soviet history, the Soviet Union, I, I would argue, was the largest scale, most far reaching social engineering experiment ever performed on, on mankind. Um, in some ways, we are still grappling with the sheer scale of the experiment and, and the sheer scale of, of the failure. It was an attempt not only to remake a government um, or not even only to remake a society, but to actually re-engineer human beings. Um, it, it lasted for some 70 years. Um, those of you know, the, the Iron Curtain in Eastern Europe fell in 1989. Um, and at the end of 1991, the Soviet Union fell apart. That was my coming of age, at least Steve's coming of age too. That was, that was our generation. Uh, that was the moment that brought me to Eastern Europe. I'm not Ukrainian. I'm not East European. I was an American growing up in a Jewish community in suburban Pennsylvania, and I was caught up by the, the drama of that moment. Afterwards, nobody knew what would happen afterwards. Nobody had ever actually tried to do this before, to go then from you know, a, a communist command economy and transition back. But there was a feeling at that time you know, of a kind of wicked witch is dead and now we're going to live happily ever after. And this was very much embodied in Fukuyama's idea of the end of history. The end of history, not in the kind of Heideggerian sense of finitude, we're all going to die, but the end of history in the Hegelian sense that you know, now we have reached the moment when, you know, when historical evolution has reached its climax and we all now know that the climax, the end of history was not actually going to be communist utopia, instead it's going to be liberal democracy. So you kind of replace one Hegelian narrative with another Hegelian narrative. And part of that story, which was very much the moment at which I came of age in the 90s, was that democracy, liberalism, and free market neoliberalism were all part of some harmonious whole. All those things kind of went together. You know, so if you engaged in free trade relations you know, with countries or with people who might be nasty dictators, they were going to get over that. They were eventually all going to kind of move towards liberal Democrats. And yes, it was going to be difficult. You know, it would be bumpy. Um, it would be, there would be some shock therapy involved, but basically we're going in a good direction. We're now on the right train. Um, and ultimately we're all gonna live happily ever after. I think one of the things we did not appreciate in the West was just how traumatic the 1990s were um, for many people in former communist countries. It wasn't just a little bit rough, you know, it was, it was brutal and it was groundless and it was terrifying. I think we all thought like, okay, there are these like transition coming of age bumps, but the kinks are gonna be worked out and soon we'll be on our way to happily ever after. Um, in any case, what the, the Soviet Union, 15 constituent republics, um, it breaks up. Some of them you know, are in a better position than others. Um, some of them are better positioned to join the European Union than others. Um, some of them are stronger economies than others. Ukraine gets its independence more or less handed to it. You know, there had been you know, civil society movements, there had been demonstrations, but basically, they didn't really have to fight. The Soviet Union breaks up, they get independence. Um, and then like a lot of the post-communist world, um, especially the post-Soviet post-communist world, the transition ends up being kind of rough. You don't actually kind of get rid of all the old apparatchiks from the communist party. Those people tend to kind of stick around and get transformed into robber baron capitalist. Uh, Leonid Kravchuk, who becomes the leader of Ukraine, you know, after it's already become an independent state, comes right through the elite of the Communist Party. Um, his successor, Leonid Kuchma, enters politics in that post-communist period and is just mired in corruption scandals. Um, my friend Vol Volodymyr Kulik calls this the blackmail state, what was just saturated with corruption and kleptocratic oligarchy, which was very much the trend. 
And that kind of languished, you know, more or less for, you know, a, a dozen or so more years. And then in, in 2002, there's an, a presidential election. There's a presidential election between two victors. Um, a, a lot of there, there are lots of victors in Ukraine, just like there are also lots of Katyas and, you know, there are lots of Sashas. Um, so presidential election between two victors. One of those victors um, was, was Viktor Yanukovych, who comes from this far eastern part of Ukraine and who's a gangster. I mean, he's not even really pretending not to be a gangster. He's just a gangster gangster. Um, you know, he's had a kind of rough life. You know, he's like stolen his money. He's, you know, had various charges for robbery, assault. Um, not a nice guy, but lots of those guys were not nice guys. Close to the Kremlin, you know, close to that world. And then there's another victor, Victor Yushchenko, who seems to be, you know, much more westward looking, who seems to have visions of bringing Ukraine into Europe, um, of opening it to foreign languages, to English, to influence of the non-Soviet world, to going in the direction of liberal democracy. And lots of nasty things happen during that election campaign, one of which is that Yanukovych's team poisons Yushchenko with dioxin, um, not successfully enough to actually kill him, but successfully enough to grotesquely disfigure his face and that disfigured face of Viktor Yushchenko by dioxin poisoning in some ways becomes the iconic image of those elections. Um, as a result of that dioxin poisoning and of widespread and generally ostentatious election fraud, Yanukovych is declared the winner. And at that point, Ukrainians go out onto the streets. They in particular go out onto the big square in the center of Kiev. And for those of you who have never been to Kiev, let me just briefly mention that the, the central square in the center of Kiev is called the Maidan. It's, I mean, all of these European cities have, have central squares. This is a particularly large one. It's particularly large and it's a complex geographical space. It's multi-level, there's a kind of shopping mall underground, there's a subway there. It's, I mean, I'm not an architecture person, but it, it's a complex space that offers many possibilities and just is very capacious. Um, people go out in November, 2013, onto the streets, into the Maidan, demanding free elections. And for three weeks, Ukrainians stay there and they shout and they freeze. And kind of miraculously, they win. Um, the, the elections are redone. This time, Yushchenko is declared the winner. Um, Everybody is very happy and they go home. And there's a sense of we've resolved uh, this problem. Um, and as you can probably guess, the short version of that story is that it was not actually happily ever after that time. Um, for some large variety of perhaps overdetermined reasons, Yushchenko does not turn out to be the messiah figure that people had hoped for. Um, there's very quickly, there's infighting on his staff. There's a falling out with the prime minister. Um, people become disillusioned and dissatisfied. There are various theories. Perhaps he was never the same after the di dioxin poisoning. Was he pandering to nationalists? In any case, it doesn't go well. People are very disappointed. In the meantime, Yanukovych, who it just seemed impossible could be ever heard from again, he was not a particularly impressive person to be, for, begin with. And he has been revealed to have poisoned his opponent with dioxin and to have cheated on the elections. And you think he's so thoroughly discredited that it's all over. But, but Yanukovych, you know, who's managed to you know, steal with a bunch of all these other oligarchs incredible amounts of the country's resources and build himself fancy villas and private zoos with ostriches and such, um, he would like to come back. And uh, he, he finds out that you know, perhaps not in Ukraine, but in, in our country, in the States, and in fact, not far from George Mason University in um, Washington, there's a guy who has a little boutique industry going for gangsters with presidential ambitions. Um, and so he decides to hire that person um, from Washington as a consultant. Um, and uh, that guy who doesn't speak Ukrainian or doesn't speak or Russian, um, goes over to Kiev, 
plays golf with Yanukovych, gets him a new haircut, you know, retailers the suits, you know, gives him some media training. I don't know exactly what they do. Um, personally, I, I didn't really see it. Um, Yanukovych didn't seem any more impressive to me after this makeover by his fancy consultant from the boutique industry specializing in gangsters with presidential ambitions. But, um, but other people apparently did because Yanukovych comes back in 2010, this time to legitimately win the 2010 elections. And as a thank you present, he gives his American consultant um, a jar of caviar that was worth some $20,000. That, uh, that American consultant, by the way, his name was Paul Manafort, and you may have heard of him in other contexts. Um, so Yanukovych comes back to win that election. He's president of Ukraine. He's not particularly charismatic. Um, He's still very much kind of, you know, in the in the, under the influence of the Kremlin. But he's also nominally leading the country towards possibly someday European Union integration. And that's a kind of carrot that dangled out to, you know, a non-trivial demographic in Ukraine. Um, in November 2013, there was he was set to sign a very long anticipated, long awaited association agreement with the European Union. Now, this was not a membership agreement. This did not mean that Ukraine became a member of the European Union, but it was an association agreement. It meant there was going to be some relationship. It likely would have involved Ukraine's undertaking very costly reforms. It surely would have provoked retaliation by the president, by, from the pre Kremlin, from Putin. And at the end of the day, it did not promise any European Union membership to come for Ukraine. Nevertheless, um, it was a foot in the door. It was symbolically of enormous significance. It was a sign that that Ukraine had intentions of reforming itself in such a way to move towards Europe. And it was a sign that if only provisionally and conditionally, Europe was open to accepting Ukraine. Now, for some people, this didn't mean anything. You know, for many people in places like the Donbass who were elderly, who were on pensions, who were never imagined they were going to have the resources or the inclinations to travel to other places in Europe anyway, this was of relatively little significance. To a young and upwardly mobile generation, this meant everything. Whether or not Europe would be open to them, if you were you know, 15 or 18 or 22 or 25, that was your future. Were you going to be able to study abroad? Would you be eligible for internships in Brussels? Would you even be able to travel abroad without spending enormous amounts of time and resources and money, humiliating yourself, pleading for visas and standing in lines? Um, would you be able to go on Erasmus exchanges? You know, would you be able to participate in you know, international enterprises? You know, what kind of future would you have? Would the doors of the world be open or shut to you? It, it was everything for these young people. It was their future. Um, and so the people for whom it mattered, you know, were a fairly distinct demographic and they were above all younger people, although not exclusively. Suddenly at the last minute on November 21st, uh, 2013, literally at the last minute, the signing ceremony in Vilnius had all been prepared. Everything was ready. Um, it seemed like it was already done. And Yanukovych at the last minute, it seems under pressure from Putin, suddenly said, no, I'm not gonna sign. And at that sense, there was, that moment, there was a sense of despair, especially by from, on the part of the intelligentsia, especially on the part of these, these students, there was a sense that suddenly their future had been stolen from them. In one moment, it had just been taken away. Um, and there was a sense of like being ground down and devastated. Now, even so, nothing might have happened. And this, like all stories, as Steve and other historians know, is, is one of very much contingency. You know, if one or two things hadn't happened the way they had, everything would be different. 
in this case, um, one of the great acts of contingency is a Facebook post. So at that time, a 32-year-old Afghan-Ukrainian journalist named Mustafa Nayem post on Facebook in Russian. That, that day, as soon as the news came in um, that Yanukovych was not going to sign, a little note, just a couple sentences on Facebook. And he says, hey guys, let's get serious. If you're really upset, come out to the Maidan by midnight tonight. And then he wrote, likes do not count. Now, interestingly, that sentence often got mistranslated into English, which I find odd because it's one of these rare serendipitous moments where the, where the, the Slavic actually translates perfectly into English. It's literally likes do not count. But what really caused me to dwell on this as a historian was that likes do not count is a sentence that would have made no sense before Facebook. I mean, literally, it would have made no sense. And 10 years earlier, it would have been nothing. Like, likes do not count. I mean, it would have been devoid of semantic content. And now it's going to become a revolutionary slogan for the 21st century. Um, people come out. They come out to the Maidan. Hundreds of people come out. Um, primarily, but not exclusively, young people, students. They're not interested in ethnic politics. They're not interested in language politics. They're not interested in opposition political parties. Um, their slogan is Ukraine is Europe. That's it. Ukraine is Europe. They want those doors open to them. They sing, they hold hands, they hang out. Um, there's a very good atmosphere. They stay there. It keeps getting colder and colder. They stay there for nine days or so. They don't seem to be leaving. At that point, Yanukovych seems to make a decision, again, perhaps under the influence of the Kremlin, that he's not going to let this go on. So you've got, you know, several hundred to a couple thousand people on this big square in the center of Kiev. They're completely peaceful. They're primarily student age. You know, they're hanging out and playing music and they're just saying Ukraine is Europe. Ukraine is Europe. That's their thing. They call themselves Euro Maidan. Um, you know, on, on the night of um, November 29th, the 30th, around four o'clock in the morning, Yanukovych apparently decides that it's it's time for this to end um, and that he is going to send out his his riot police um, called Berkut to brutalize the students. The idea seems to be that if you terrify people by beating them up enough, although preferably not actually killing them, the parents will freak out and pull their kids off the street. Um, it is definitely a breach of a social contract because despite all the oligarchic kleptocracy, the corruption, the blackmail, um, the you know, occasional assassinations of, you know, of critical journalists, since 1991, there had been no mass large-scale violence on the part of the regime to its own population. And there was a sense that there was a social contract. You know, people may be treated brutally. There may be kind of, there may be no rule of law. The country's resources may be being stolen by Yanukovych and his befriended oligarchs, but there was not mass violence against the Ukrainian people. And so it was, it was a shock. Um, and there was a, a, a conviction that, that that was going to, a conviction apparently on the part of Yanukovych, although I have no privileged epistemological access to what's, what's going on in his head, um, that this was going to you know, scare the parents into pulling their kids off the streets and bringing them home. And then something extraordinary happened. And as a historian, I was completely captivated by this. Um, because instead of pulling their kids off the streets and bringing them home, the parents joined them there. So many rebellions in history could be implotted as edible rebellions, you know, each generation in its turn rising up against the parents. Um, and this time you have almost a kind of Hegelian Aufhebung of edible rebellion, you know, where that, that you go from having, you know, several hundred, 2,000 people on this square in the center of Kiev, you know, mostly between the ages of, you know, 16 and 25, you know, suddenly 36 hours later, 
you have hundreds of thousands of people on the streets of Kiev. No one has ever seen that many people on the streets of Kiev. And now they're not just shouting, Ukraine is Europe. Now they're shouting, we will not permit you to beat our children. Uh, and that was really when something turned. You know, that was when what had been Euromaidan just became Maidan without the prefix. And it became about something much more than an association agreement with the European Union. Now it really became an impassioned revolt against the brutality with which a regime was treating its own citizens. Um, I, I, one of the young people, I, one of the things that fascinated me again as a historian and as somebody who teaches Freud um, is the relationship among generations. You know, people then started going to the Maidan with their parents, with their children, sometimes with three generations, with their parents and their grandparents. Um, and so I was interested in interviewing pairs of, of parents and children. And one of the, the pairs of parents and children I, I interviewed was Taras and Roman Ratushni. Um, and, and the Roman was, he was only 16 at the time. Um, and he was literally, I mean, he was literally a kid. He wasn't even a university student yet. He was, you know, he was still in secondary school. He was living with his mother. You know, his shoulder was battered in that night by Berkut. And, you know, when, when we met at this you know, mutual friends and we met at this cafe in Kiev, I said, you know, your mother must have been very upset, but she let you go back. And he said, my mother, my mother was making Molotov cocktails on Khrushchev Street. <laughs> Um, and that, that's when the Maidan became something that nobody had expected. Um, it, it became not just a protest movement, but a whole parallel world. There was a concept that the, the Czech Catholic philosopher Václav Benda developed um, in communist Czechoslovakia in the late 1970s called the Parallel Polis. Um, Paul Wilson translated that essay. If anyone's interested, I'm happy to pass along the reference. It's, it's little known and forgotten today, but was actually very important at the time. It's very short. And the idea that was of, of opposition to a, a tyrannical regime, not just as a protest movement, but as the creation of a kind of parallel society, an alternative society, self-organized, in which you are living according to the principles and the values you would like to see in the world. You would like to see on behalf of the whole society. Um, you reproduce, you know, just like you reproduce institutions in the public sphere in this parallel world. So within a couple of days in December, 2013, you have kitchens operating, mass kitchens operating at the Maidan. You have all these people cooking and making sandwiches and making tea and making coffee and you know, cooking soup in cauldrons. You have an open university, you have a stage, you have a piano, you have public film screenings, clothing distributions, medical points set up. You have a whole parallel world. You literally, you know, people are, people begin to live on the Maidan, you know, or take shifts coming to the Maidan. You know, people are on the Maidan day and night, you know, and they're not just, there's a whole world there that's going on, you know, and it's an extraordinary feat of self-organization. And it's an extraordinary feat of civil society, um, which I was also kind of fascinated by because people might not have guessed that there was such an elaborate infrastructure of civil society. But one of the things you see is that these tiny little seeds of things, once planted, can suddenly explode. Um, one of the things, I, at that time I was in Vienna, I, I wasn't there, I wasn't in Kiev, I was at a research institute in Vienna, in which I had several friends and colleagues who were Ukrainian, who were basically shuttling back and forth between Kiev and Vienna the whole time. You know, and so people would like get off the plane and we would all jump on them and say, what's going on, what's going on? And I remember one time like it went that the violence on the part of the regime became more and more brutal as the winter went on. Um, people were being kidnapped 
um, their bodies would be found, you know, tortured and frozen in the woods. When people were injured, they would be kidnapped from hospitals. Um, it's one of the reasons they set up medical points so people didn't have to go to the hospitals. Elaborate networks of volunteers were set up. Um, an SOS hotline appeared. So if somebody was in danger or somebody was caught by the police or by these tutushki, these kind of, you know, hired gangster mercenaries, um, there was a hotline you could immediately call, you know, and people who would come. And I remember my, my friend Katya got to Vienna and I said, how did you guys get a hotline like overnight? Um, I, I don't know how to set up a hotline. And she said, oh, you know, there was this LGBT group that had a confidential hotline and they just kind of donated it. Like, and I, and this, as a historian, this struck me as the kind of detail that seems trivial, but is actually quite revealing. You know, because, okay, maybe a group has, has a small hotline, you know, maybe a handful of people are calling every week and discussing personal issues and maybe like, but you, you've got something in place. You, you've got, you've got something nascent in place. You have some structure, even if on a modest scale, um, and that then becomes the basis of something exploding. Um, so it was, it was a master work of, of self-organization. It was also an incredible moment of overcoming of boundaries. Um, and, and here I'll, I'll say, and I don't want to talk too much longer because I know you guys want to ask questions. And then maybe I'll get to see some of you, which I can't at the moment. But I was in this very strange position because I was an American watching this live streamed from Vienna. Um, and one of the things that was interesting about the Maidan was the role of social media because the regime was controlling the official media. So you went to the social media to assert your own story. Um, the Maidan live streamed itself. I mean, they set up cameras you know, on themselves. You could actually watch the Maidan live streamed you know, 24 hours a day in addition to all the social media you know, that, that was going on. Um, and so I was, I was watching this streamed. I was watching from Vienna. I was an American. I was reading the German press. I was reading the English language press. I was reading, re reading the Russian language press, um, the Ukrainian Russian language press. But I was also, and in some sense, what was most important to me was I was following it in Polish. Um, and I think one of the reasons why I was most drawn into that is that, and I'm not Polish either, um, has to do with what it meant for me to follow it through the eyes of my older Polish friends who were veterans of, of Solidarność, of solidarity. Um, and I know lots of people are listening who are way too young to have known about solidarity. So maybe I'll just say a moment of that as, this, as, as a mass um, opposition movement to the communist regime that comes into being um, through the late 70s and in and, and the 1980s. And there are two fantastic Polish films that all of you should watch if you want to commune with this story by the, the late director Andrzej Wajda. One is Man of Marble, it's set in the Stalinist period, and one is Man of Iron, that is then set in the Solidarity period. And what happens in Poland in 1968 is that students protest against the communist regime. Um, and in the film, there's a young man, a student, who comes to his father, who is a shipyard worker, when the students are out protesting and are being brutally beaten by the police and imprisoned. And the, the, the son comes to the father and asks him to bring out the workers on behalf of the students in solidarity. And the father refuses. Um, not only does he refuse to help, he locks his son in his room. And then he says, you know, someday when the time is right, we'll march together. And the son is livid. You know, and he vows they will never march together. He will never forgive him. Um, and two years later, um, and this is a fictionalized scene in the film, and it's also a you know event in real life. Um, it's the shipyard workers who protest in 1970. And in the film, that father comes to the son and asks him then to bring out his friends in support of the workers. And essentially, the son says, "You know, hey, you let us down two years ago. Now you go to hell." Um, and what solidarity was and the miracle that was solidarity was the coming together, not just of the people on, on the right and the left and the Jews and the Catholics, you know, and, and the former Marxist and the Christians and the workers and the intellectuals, but also the fathers and the sons. Um, and my, 
to some extent, I kind of intellectually came of age, you know, under the mentorship of these people born in, in at, right after the war in the mid to late 40s, who were veterans of solidarity. They know better than anybody else that that kind of overcoming of boundaries lasted 20 seconds after communism fell in 1989. But they also knew that it was the greatest miracle they ever experienced in their lives. And watching the Maidan through their eyes, through their coverage, I saw it the way they saw it. They are not idealist. Um, they're not quixotic. They're not naive. They're not Pollyanna-ish. They have seen it all. They know that that kind of solidarity has never been sustained. They know that it, it flickers for a second in human history and then it's gone. But they also know that it is the kind of precious and extraordinary gift that most people never experience in their lifetimes, and they never counted on living to see a second time. And, and that, was, that was a lot, I think a lot of how I came to understand the Maidan was understanding it like through their eyes. And when I, when I saw some of those people in, in Kiev in the, the, that spring, you know, Adam Miknik came, Alex Muller came, Agnieszka Holland, um, Konstant Gebert, you know, all of these people were coming to Kiev and they were, they were ecstatic. And not because they were naive, but because they understood how precious this was. Um, okay, I see there's not so much time. So let me just maybe talk to you about what that, um, what that experience was. So my, my book, um, for those of you who are interested, it was very kind of Steve to, to show it to you. My book is not a political analysis of that revolution. It's very much about the experience of that revolution. You know, it's about what people experienced and felt being there, what it meant to cross to the other side of fear, what it meant to lose track of day and night, um, what it meant, what how time changed during revolution, what it meant to be live streamed all the time. Um, one thing that you, I could feel even watching over the internet, I mean, and also through the accounts of my friends who were coming back and forth, was that this wasn't just a political transformation, it was an existential transformation. People were changing, they were literally changing before my eyes, and the society was changing. Um, you know, pe it, it, people were, were bringing out a side of themselves that they didn't realize existed, um, that they, were, they hadn't realized that they could be pushed to the other side of fear. Um, people had never experienced that kind of solidarity with other human beings before. In, in late November, nobody was thinking they were going to die there. And by the second half of January, you could feel it kind of almost palpably and even from a distance that a critical mass of people had made a decision and they were willing to die there if need be. And it, it was terrifying. I mean, and it was, and then you were, you were just waiting for the end game to come and you knew it would, and you knew it was going to be bloody and you knew that they weren't going to leave that that kind of decision had come down in kind of the, the strongest existentialist sense. Um, and that it, the standoff continued um, until you know, late February, um, 2014, you know, at which point, you know, put, uh, which point Yanukovych's regime unleashed a sniper massacre. Um, and there was a few days of kind of, of gruesome, bloody final battles on the Maidan. Um, and even then, you know, reinforcements kept coming in, you know, buses where people were being massacred in Kiev, you know, and these young men were getting on these buses in Lviv, you know, and driving, riding all night to get there you know, to bring in those reinforcements. And you just knew that people were not going to leave. 
they had made that decision they were not going to leave. I mean, it was a moment of we are no longer going to be treated as playthings of the regime. We're no longer going to be treated as objects. We're going to insist on being subjects. Um, the idea of subjectivity became very important. I mean, this is where the idea of the revolution of dignity comes from. It's dignity and literally in the Kantian sense. Um, and so, you know, Kant had this definition that, you know, anything that has a price. Um, anything that can be replaced by something of equal value has a price. Anything that is beyond all, all price and admits of no equivalent has dignity. Human beings are distinguished in that we possess dignity. From that comes the categorical imperative. You always treat another human being as an end and not as a means. Subjectivity was the word that Ada Miknik injected into the dissident discourse in Poland in the 70s and 80s. You know, and during the Maidan, a Polish historian friend of mine said at one point, he's like, well, Marcy, subjectivity. The last time I heard that word was during the days of solidarity. You know, it means to be a person and not a thing. It means to take responsibility. It means to accept that you are someone with agency, that you are not passive. And it means that I will no longer be treated, you know, as a thing by this regime. Um, and I think the Europe that came to be at stake of the Maidan was then no longer just the empirical, highly imperfect instantiation of the European Union, but almost Europe in the sense of a platonic essence of Europeness as it should be where it represents human dignity, the rule of law and human rights. Um, Europe in the sense that... Um, Western civilization was in when Gandhi was asked famously um, what he thought of Western civilization. And Gandhi says, it would be a very good thing. The Europe that was at stake on the Maidan was that Europe that would be a very good thing. You know, it was the, you know, it was we want to live in a regime, you know, of, of human dignity and, and human rights. Um, there is a bloody massacre in February. Um, the Polish foreign minister, Radek Sikorski, um, together with his French and German counterparts, flies to Kiev during that time to try to negotiate a ceasefire with Yanukovych. Um, one of the things I found fascinating um, that I wrote about in the book was talking to Radek afterwards about those conversations. You know, Radek is very tough. I mean, he's not like neurotic and sentimental like I am. Like he's, you know, <laughs> he, he's tough. He was like covering, you know, he was covering the Afghanistan war. You know, he's seen a lot. He remembers solidarity. He's not easily scared. Um, he has, you know, he's been in, in foreign policy for a long time. He knows exactly who he's dealing with. It's not like he thinks, oh, maybe Yanukovych is really a nice guy in his own way. So you fly over there. The, the presidential palace, I should add, in Kiev is very close to the Maidan. You're talking about maybe 200 meters away. I mean, you can smell the smoke. The whole square is, is burning. And you're sitting in this room with this man. And you know that with each additional five minutes you take, more people are being killed. You know, and afterwards, I said, you know, Radek, like, you know, people are being massacred there. Like, did, did Yanukovych have any feeling about that at all? You know, and Radek is like, you know, Marcy, he's not that bright. I mean, he doesn't have that much of an emotional imagination. Like, no, he didn't seem to care at all. Um, and um, finally, they, you know, they got this, you know, they got a ceasefire agreement, you know, provisionally down, you know, Yanukovych agrees to hold early elections several months later. Um, the Maidan does not want to accept that. Their people are being murdered. They don't want Yanukovych in power for another two minutes, you know, nevertheless, for another few months. Um, in, in a clip that was captured on the internet, you know, Radek is like, hey, you know, I, I, I was in Poland in 1981 when, when we, we underestimated the strength of the regime. We got martial law and mass detainment. You know, you you take this now and then later you ask for more. Otherwise, you know, otherwise it's going to be the army. It's going to be martial law. You'll all be dead. Um, um, and that convinced some people they signed. Um, but there was a sense of fury. I mean, they're carrying the coffins with their people through this crowd, a sense of extraordinary anger. Um, and within 36 hours, Yanukovych had disappeared. It turns out he flees across the border to Russia where Putin shelters him. Um, Paul Manafort is now out of a job and we all know what he does next. Um, 
So you have this moment of mass mourning and kind of chaos because the president's fled. There's no real government in place. No one really knows what the army's up to. Putin says he sends the uh, people that the uh, Ukrainians start referring to as Zeloni Chlovyetsky, like little green men. So like guys in unmarked camouflage to the Crimean Peninsula to just take it at a moment when no one can even catch their breath. Um, and then he sends so-called Russian tourists um, across the border into Ukraine, anti-Maidan Russian tourists, to instigate rebellions, um, separatist rebellions. You know, so late February, March, April, May, nobody knows what's going to happen. There's a feeling that a war could be ignited, that Putin is trying to ignite a war, that he's trying to get parts of Ukraine to succeed, that he has planted stories um, or rather disseminate his trolls have disseminated stories that the Maidan was a CIA conspiracy and Ukrainian Nazis are now heading eastwards to massacre all the native Russian speakers. Um, this was produced at the same time troll factory in St. Petersburg that gave us the story that Hillary Clinton was kidnapping children and holding them captive in the basement of a pizza place in Washington. Um, they seem to like coming up with stories, throwing spaghetti against the wall, and, and from time to time something sticks. Um, for those of you who have never been to Ukraine or who are like non-Slavicist, so Ukraine is really a bilingual country. Um, in general, as you go west, you know, Ukrainian is a stronger language, and as you go east, Russian is a stronger language, but that kind of obscures the point that everybody can function in both languages, and there was never any chance that any Ukrainian Nazis who didn't exist were coming east to kill any of the native Russian speakers. Um, what, maybe I'll just tell one very brief anecdote about that. What happens is that the, there's violence in various cities but the, the separatist rebellion instigated by the Kremlin only really takes off, you know, in certain places in the Donbass, this far eastern post-industrial mining region, um, at which you then have some motley crew of local gangsters, Kremlin mercenaries, the Russian soldiers who start taking over buildings and declaring themselves breakaway republics. Um, and I'll just maybe the last thing I'll tell you is my my uh, another Katya um, who was in Donetsk at the time and was running a kind of art forum art space there with several friends and colleagues that then got turned into what is now an infamous dungeon and torture chamber there that uh, Stasha Sayev has written about. Um, and when I, I talked to her after she had already fled to Kiev and she was trying to describe these different groups of people and what it was like being in Donetsk at the beginning of these separatist rebellions. And she said, Marcy, and then one day these Chechens came and their Russian wasn't even very good. And then they couldn't understand why they were getting these, this Ukrainian currency and not Russian currency from the bank machines. And then they called this meeting on Lenin Square and this elderly you know, Christian grandmother comes out and gives an Orthodox christening to the leading Chechen soldier so that he'll be victorious in battle against the Ukrainian Nazis. And we're, we're sitting at this like little tea house in Kiev and she's trying to like relate all this like very calmly, you know, but she's like, Marcy, everything is surreal in this story. You have the Christian Orthodox women on the communist square giving an Orthodox christening to a Muslim soldier so that he can go kill non-existent Ukrainian Nazis. So everything in this story is fiction and it's all really happening to us. Um, so that, that's just to kind of give you a, a sense um, about this grotesque war in the Donbass, that little known place as people about whom we know nothing that has been lingering and simmering for the past eight years. Some 13, 14,000 people have been killed. There were between a million and a half and two million refugees who had to flee and leave their homes, becoming internally displaced persons, that is refugees in their own country. Um, and that was the state of affairs um, until February, um, this past February, uh, the 24th, when Putin launched a, a full-scale invasion. Um, so maybe I'll stop there and let you ask questions. Marcy, thanks so much. Um... Let me just say to everybody, read the Ukrainian night. Um, this, I, I think the feeling that I got listening to you, 
Marcy reminds me of the feeling that I got in reading the book um, and hearing the voices of these people that you talk about that come through so strongly in that book. Um, so we have a lot of questions that have come in already, um, questions that my students submit um, before we even start, um, because uh, we we watched Winter on Fire. We've talked about um, the the Maidan uh, a lot, and and it always raises so many uh, questions. And I want to start on on this subject of generations. Um, you talked about this, I think, in in very interesting ways about there being a generational difference between those for whom an association agreement with Europe meant something and those perhaps for whom it meant less, um, but also this moment in which generations came together uh, in protest. So uh, one of my students, Natalia Tawid, asks uh, if there are significant differences in attitudes towards Ukrainian identity between older and younger Ukrainians. Uh, and, and here in particular, sort of what have been the ongoing impacts of this moment? Okay. What will the new Ukrainian identity look like um, after this war, uh, sort of sort of these kinds of questions of, of generation and, and sort of how you see that out of the experience of, of the Maidan. Okay, that's, that's a great question. Um, yeah, let me first say about parents and children. Um, so, so Roman Ratushny, that the 16 year old I, I write about in the book, um, he was killed fighting in in June um and he wasn't even 25 yet I and mean, he was eight years older than when I had met him um but there's the sense of terror that like that this war is bleeding you know that that young generation on Ukrainian identity which is a great question and it's a sociological question of which I am I'm not an expert but I'm going to draw on some work of some co Ukrainian colleagues here so one of the things that, uh, instance, my historian colleague Yaroslav Herzog spoke about a lot during the Maidan, which for him, I think as, as a person on the left was so meaningful, was it was the, the moment he felt of the coming together of a civic nation. Um, you know, of, of a sense of, you, to be Ukrainian as a choice of values, you know, and not, you know, an, an ethnic litmus test, you know, and not a linguistic litmus test. Um, and that was definitely very profoundly felt. Um, you know, it was it was not about language politics at the time. Language politics now play a very different role now now that the war has has started. I mean, among other reasons, because Ukrainians can speak both Ukrainian and Russian, and Russians can only speak Russian. And so, speaking Ukrainian has also been like a you know a, a test of identity. You kind of know who is who because who can speak Ukrainian. Um, but this emergence of a civic patriotism, you know, of a patriotism that was somehow ecumenical, um, the role played by Jewish communities, Muslim communities, Greek Catholic communities, or, you know, Orthodox communities, that was very, very important, you know, on, on the Maidan. There's, there's a story I tell in the book that I I probably wouldn't have even caught if it hadn't been for uh, my colleague, David Fishman, who did a wonderful translation of this interview and published it in the foreword um, of an interview with a, a, a Jewish rabbi in his Ukrainian Jewish rabbi, I think in his thirties. Um, and he had, um, he had emigrated to Israel years earlier. Uh, he had served in the Israeli defense forces you know, he had served in Gaza. And in the meantime, his friends in Ukraine were like, hey, the Middle East is a war zone now. It's like, you know, it's miserable over there. You know, come back to Kiev. Kiev is so peaceful. Like, it's really nice here. We've got a great synagogue. You know, there's been some restoration. Um, and so he comes back. Um, he comes back. The Maidan starts. Um, he doesn't really feel like it's his thing, you know. After the, the students are beaten up, when it really turns into a whole parallel polis, he kind of wanders out there, but not intending to participate, just intending to kind of check it out. And he runs into these guys who are getting ready to storm a government building. And so, you know, he asks them what their plan is. Well, it turns out they don't really have much of a plan. And he says, well, do you know that, you know, in order to storm a building where both sides are equally armed, you need three times as many people on the storming side as on the defending side. And, um, but they had no idea, but they quickly realized that he does, 
mm-hmm. and he's had military experience yeah yeah you know and so like before he realizes that he's commanding the operation you know and then he's commanding the next operation you know and then he's like and i began to realize that this was my war you know and then slowly i he's like i broke the sabbath for the first time in my adult life and i felt no guilt about it because i was protecting civilians mm-hmm. you know i was i was saving people's lives um, and I started to tell people that I was a Jew and everybody called me brother and Ukrainian Jewish relations have not been so nice and innocent in the past, as many of you may know, um, like Ukrainian Polish relations. And this was really a moment of a kind of new chapter and to some extent, like a new generation, you know, and, and for Yaroslav Hrtsak, what was this, it was more than just Ukrainians and Jews and the Greek Orthodox, the Catholics or like, like, it I mean, it was about an emergence of a civic identity that people were making a choice about the kind of society they wanted to live in. Um, Volodymyr Kulik has done much more systematic sociological kind of political science research on this for the past eight years. I mean, he's the kind of social scientist who actually does large scale, you know, massive survey research. Um, and and he has he has work, I'm sure Steve can send you some links to that, where he looks at how Ukrainian identity has actually changed a lot towards a notion of a civic identity. Um, and that's been very important, you know, in this war, that you know, to be Ukrainian is a choice. You know, and it's the largest extent of political choice, you know, and, and Yaroslav Herzog would say that, you know, the real difference is not, it's not ethnic and it's not linguistic, it's about political culture. And it's also about seeing oneself, you know, as a subject and not as an object. I mean, these, you know, in these places where the fighting is, is most brutal um, now in Eastern Ukraine, they're almost entirely populated by, by Russian speakers, often by ethnic Russians, whatever that means as well. You know, that, um, that, that's, not, that's not what it means to be Ukrainian. To be Ukrainian is to choose to be Ukrainian, you know, and to say, I don't, I like, I, I don't want to live under Putin's neo-fascist, you know, neo-totalitarian regime. Um, and I think that's been a huge coming of age, I think. I mean, I'm not the person who's done the sociological research, so mm. you shouldn't take my word for it. But I think Ukraine has has changed, you know, and evolved tremendously in the past 30 years and dramatically in the past 10 years. Let me um, follow that up a little bit. So, so um, and I can kind of bring together um, a few different questions here from Mary Thomas, from Shmuel Metz, uh, from Samantha Messina. Um and that's to ask you, sort of going into um, the Maidan, um, it's to bring together a couple of different questions here. One was generation more important and outlook than regional location, because often it's really made out as if you know the Maidan and the revolution of the Maidan right is something that comes from the western parts of Ukraine that mm-hmm. comes from. Right. I mean, this is the way it's portrayed sometimes. It, this is this is the Ukrainian speakers and Ukrainian nationalism mm-hmm. and these kinds of things. Um, and that resistance to this comes from Eastern Ukraine. Uh, and so, you know, Mary Thomas asks in talking about what's going on in Kiev at the time uh, in 2013, 2014, what's going on in the rest of Ukraine? Um, so can you just talk a little bit about sort of regional differences and their relationship to to generational differences uh, as we're heading into this moment. And obviously you describe this as very much a crystallizing moment itself for what comes after. Um, but I'm wondering sort of uh, sort of how you see this uh, as we head into uh, November uh, of 2013. Yeah, that's a good call. I'll try to answer more briefly this time. So my sense is that in Western Ukraine, everyone was on the side of the Maidan. Like my friend Yurko Prohaska was like, you know, to come out to like the, so there was the Maidan in Kiev and then there were like the little Maidans, like the city squares where people were protesting, you know, in kind of in parallel in all these other places. And he's like, to come out to the Maidan in Lviv, you weren't risking anything. Everyone in Lviv was on the side of the Maidan. You know, there wasn't, you know, whereas if you were where Serhi Jadan was or, you know, where Volod- you know, Volodymyr Sklokin was at the time, if you were in Kharkiv, it was very, very mixed. Um, and so you were taking a much larger risk by going out then. Um, my sense when I was talking to people who were coming from, you know, not only the Donbass, but Eastern Ukraine more generally in the spring of 2014 and then into 2015, when it really was very split. 
I mean, most people were saying like in the Donbass, you've got like a third of the people on the side of Ukraine, a third of the people sympathetic to the separatists, a third of the people indifferent. They just want the shooting to stop. They just want to be left alone. Is that the lines were running much more generationally than anything else. Um, that was what like that was what I was hearing anecdotally, mm -hmm. that it's really that it was really it was not ethnic. It was really generational. Now, I think my sense now it's really changed. Um, I mean, I think that I mean that the I the terribly ironic and gruesome paradox is that there had been tremendous affinity for Russia, you know, and many families on both sides of the border, uh, many families split on both sides of the border, many people feeling very close to things in Russia, to culture in Russia, to, you know, lives that had been lived on both sides of the border, you know, and and it's been killed. I mean, it's literally been terrorized out of people, you know, because, you know, Russia has showed up and conducted a reign of terror. I mean, you've you've turned these people like you want for your own against you in the most gruesome, perverse way possible. So uh, a couple of different questions asking about sort of one, your 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 talk about solidarity uh, and and the the people who mentored you in a lot of ways, I think you described it, um, who come out of that generation. Um, and so 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 two different things here. One Zachary Sane asks, you know, is there is there a similar moment that Ukrainians look back to before Maidan? Do they look to the end of the Soviet Union mm. as a moment in a in a in a similar kind of way? Does an older generation see that and think about that in any kind of way? And then to follow on to that, um, Amanda Brown says, uh, you know, solidarity was initially united in opposition to a government uh, and its policies, but as you noted, it quickly fell into disarray once its initial demands were met. Uh, and a new government was founded. Uh, Ukrainian society is united now behind an uh, existing government and its policies to defend its sovereignty and national identity. How do you assess that difference will bode for continued unity of purpose once Russia is defeated? So I, I think, you know, both sort of, is there this this history for Ukrainians to look to in the same kind of way of what you talk about these solidarity activists who are seeing something again, but then also as you describe this as a, a, a sort of moment in time, this coming together, you know, what do you see sort of going forward from your, from your look at other revolutionary moments? This, this, if this makes sense, the question. Uh, this is a good question. What was most interesting to me was how, self-critical after 2014 people were about 2004 mm -hmm. a sense that it was an immature revolution that they thought okay you're going to get rid of the bad guy and you're going to put the good guy in power and then once you have the good czar instead of the bad czar then everyone's got everything's going to be okay like okay we got we got our guy in and he was going to take care of everything and so everyone was happy and then we went home and that it was it was immature in the sense that we didn't fully take responsibility, you know, and that there was a sense of like, no, it has to be us, you know, the society has to be engaged in the public sphere, it has to be engaged in civic education, you can't, there's no, there's no messiah, I mean, Slava Varkarchuk, the Ukrainian rock star who's very civically engaged, um, kept repeating this, like, there's no messiah, no one is going to lead us into the promised land, it's just us. You know, it's us, it's every day, you know, it's all of us taking responsibility, you know, all the time. We are the ones who are building our society. There's no like great leader, you know, for whom like we can all follow, you know, and I think that's been a real coming of age moment, you know, this taking of responsibility. And I, I mean, it's extraordinary when like, I mean, eight years ago, Ukraine didn't really have a functioning army. I mean, that war starts in the Donbass and like the army is being crowdsourced on the internet. And when I was in Dnipro, which was then Dnipro Petrovsk in 2015, prisoner exchanges were being negotiated by civil society activists. I mean, everything was, it was all volunteer efforts. And the amazing thing is that like, now Russia invades on the scale that was like unimaginable for all of us. And it turns out that the Ukrainian army is incredibly competent. You know, and it turns out like in the past eight years, 
you know, there's been extraordinary amounts of preparation. I mean, I'm, in some ways I'm biased because like some of these people who are now like both fighting in the East and working on military strategy are like students I had worked with or taught Kant and Kolokowski <laughs> to. And like, so I like, I feel like, oh, I know they're brilliant. Like, of course, <laughs> I uh, you know, I, I wish they could be like at the university, like, you know, teaching their own classes now that they you're finishing their dissertations. Um, but there's a sense of, one of the things that happened in the Maidan that I think was significant, and somebody, one of the young activists a few years ago when I saw them at Stanford actually, you know, said that somebody should write this story about us. The activists from the Maidan who went into, who continued to be activists, who either went into the parliament or went into NGOs or went into civil society activism or went into reforms, or you know, some of whom were 21, 22 on the Maidan and then have devoted themselves to the public sphere. Well, those eight years of coming of age were meaningful for them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the, the generation, I mean, you can't help noticing that the generation of the Russian leadership in contrast, the generation of the Ukrainian leadership now, and there's there's a radical right, contrast. Right. So let me ask you one last question. We're running out of time. Um, so here we are eight years later. Um, how do you see the Maidan uh, going forward from here? How will we look back at it? Will we look back at it as you know, an event that was sort of swallowed up by all that came after? Um, or will it be an event that continues to have ongoing significance for Ukrainians and for, for yeah. people beyond Ukraine? Um, I mean, I'm biased because it was the most extraordinary thing I had seen in real time. Like in all the years I had been hanging out in Eastern Europe, which is now like my whole adult life. Um, yes, I think it will continue to have significant. I think it was, I think it was one of those turning points you know, through which not that there's never a happily ever after moment. There is no such thing. There's no such moment where everything is okay. But I think it was a transformative moment. Um, and I think it was especially transformative in the creation of, of a young generation. And I've seen some of these people. I mean, some of these students I met, you know, eight years ago during the Maidan who were university students who are now in their late 20s and early 30s. And I see them stepping up and I see the role they're playing and how that experience was formative for them. And, and I think that's what they're doing now is just extraordinary. I mean, nobody thought, nobody thought Ukraine could last more than three days. I mean, one of the you know, one of my my political science colleagues who knows stuff about the military, which I know nothing about, you know, said like Marcy, like, remember those, you know, remember that convoy of, of Russian tanks that was going towards Kiev in those three days? Well, this might not be obvious to you because you don't know anything about the military, but no military would stage that kind of a convoy mm. unless they were very confident that they were going to meet with a, a positive reception and be having a victory parade three days later. And I thought, Wow, you know, nobody who's been to Kiev in the past eight years, who's been there for an hour and stopped for coffee, you know, could possibly think the Russian army was going to get a good reception in Kiev, yeah. regardless of what language they spoke, regardless of what their ethnic background mm, was. Right. Like, it was obvious that those people were going to fight. It was absolutely like, I, I had no idea whether Putin would actually invade, but I was sure that if he did, they would fight. Marcy, thank you so much. Um, this has been such a phenomenal talk. Uh, I think you really put in words what I've been trying to do this semester far better than what I uh, have been able to, which is to say, uh, you know, in in my class that that these these uh, are all part of. Um, I've tried to share lots of Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian history. My students are watching Ukrainian films and reading Ukrainian novels, and um, and th this notion that you had at the beginning that that we 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 make this a place that people know and that they understand and therefore that they care about and understand why we can't lose this, uh, I think comes through so clearly in your writing, uh, so clearly in, in your discussion today. Um, so uh, thank you so very much uh, for everybody. Uh, next week, um, we'll have somebody who can actually speak to uh, these military questions. Uh, my colleague here uh, at George Mason University, Christopher Hamner, uh, who is a professor of military history, uh, will come. He'll be able to answer all kinds of questions that I'm sure so many of you have had 
that I have also said, I, I know nothing about these kinds mm -hmm. of things. Um, so please, by the way, feel free over the course of the week to, to tag me to um, hashtag RWOU on Twitter if you have specific questions in advance that you'd like me to ask Dr. Hamner uh, when he comes next week. So we'll be back at three o'clock uh, next Monday. Um, in addition, please uh, come and join us on Friday, Cynthia Hooper from Holy Cross and myself at 3 p.m. Uh, we'll just spend an hour taking your questions, talking, having a great discussion. We've really enjoyed the first two times uh, that we've done this. We've really been able to uh, in engage with um, the visitors in a way that's that's harder when you have 300 people coming uh, or more every time that, that we've been gathering. But I'm so grateful that so many of you are here. Uh, I really think it's a meaningful statement that you've come to be part of this. Uh, and uh, I'll see everybody back uh, in a week. Thanks. Mm.